All right, folks, one more video about this lens flare visible in stereo head HI2 being caused by Venus. Uh, here we are again at the same image that started off the previous video and was also at the end of the previous video. And some people are saying this is evidence that I photoshopped out the lens flare. No, I didn't. <laughs> As I said in the previous video, you won't see it with this level of contrast enhancement because it's too dim, but it is in the image. I didn't photoshop it out. It's just dim. Uh, if we look at the versions available on the stereo website, we see this is the start of the lens flare right here, and then it grows later on, but it starts off right about there, and that's where it is in this image, but you can't see it because the contrast enhancement isn't high enough. But I did this just to show that the HI2 imager can take a beautiful picture of the stars, the Milky Way, so on and so forth, but... At this level of contrast enhancement, you won't necessarily see very, very dim things in the image. These images are not 8-bit images natively. 8-bit images are what you're used to seeing online with your computer, but these are 16-bit images natively, and that means they have more dynamic range than can natively be displayed on your monitor. So you have to adjust the histogram, you have to adjust the levels and the curves to try to bring out the relevant parts of the dynamic range that you want to see. In this case, for this image, I just wanted to see the dynamic range that contained the Milky Way and the stars. But if I crank up the contrast much higher, now we lose the Milky Way. It's, it, the detail's gone, it's, it's washed out. But again, I've had to convert these to 8-bit images so you can see them uh, in their normal uh, way. And you know, these are just 8-bit JPEGs now. But if I, if I flip between uh, this image, June, June 1st and June 2nd, now you can see where the lens flare is in the image. It's right here, same place where it is in the version available from the stereo website, right here. Watch that spot. And when I flip between this image and this image, you can see it. It's there. It's moving. Let me zoom in on that some more. See it there? Right here. I didn't Photoshop it out. It's there. It's just very dim. That's how it looks. That's how it is. Now, if I uh, go to July 5th, over a month later, you can see it's grown. It's now much brighter. It's easier to see. But it's still very dim compared to the Milky Way. This is at the same level of contrast enhancement as these images. So it's still, you know, very dim compared to other things in the image. But people are saying, well, why, why does it look like that? On the stereo website, it's very well defined, so it's got to be the same brightness as Venus. No, you, you can't make that comparison. You can't take a look at the JPEGs that are available on the stereo website and assume that something is equal brightness to something else simply because it looks that way in these images. These images have been very dramatically contrast enhanced and uh, have gone through processing to remove the stars from the image and leave whatever is left that isn't moving like a star. That's to bring out the very tenuous heliosphere, which is also very dim, like a lens flare. But to bring that out, they do this fancy processing I'll show you. So I can make it look like that if I want to. Uh, the other effect that will have is it will bring out the tail of the comet. People have been saying, well, the tail ends much sooner than it does in the stereo images, so he must have photoshopped that out too or something. No, it's just very dim. It's very hard to see uh, without doing dramatically more contrast enhancement. So if I go to my, my uh, program for handling 16-bit FITS files, so here's a version I did in a manner similar to what they do on the stereo website. It's a little bit different because I have images that are spaced one day apart. They have, of course, many images per day. Also, I've got this ghost from Mercury. This is a ghost from Mercury, which Mercury isn't in the image, but I've used images from a couple years before uh, in a median combined to subtract from uh, these images to eliminate, eliminate the solar glare. That's what I've done to these images. I've done two things uh, to this one and this one. I've eliminated the solar glare and I've aligned them relative to each other uh, based on the positions of the stars. So the stars, if you superimpose these images, would be in the same positions in both versions. Uh, both both these images from July 4th and from July 5th. Um, but in the process of eliminating the solar glare, I created this, uh, this leftover from Mercury because Mercury was in the calibration image. That's basically why. Um, 
You can also, of course, see Venus. And oh, look, the lens flare is now looking as bright as Venus. The comet tail looks uniformly bright all the way down to about here, uh, even though it's really not. Uh, this image is to basically show you how bright these things really are or aren't. And that gives you a much truer representation of that. This version is to bring out any tenuous feature which isn't moving like the stars are. Um, that's what they do on the stereo website, basically. So how do they do that? Well, they do these differentials where they align them on the stars like I've done and then subtract them from each other. So if I subtract image 5 from image 7 and then do a lot of contrast enhancement, this is what I get. And there you go. So I haven't photoshopped it out. They are in the raw image data. It's just processed in a different way on the stereo website, which makes it look deceptively bright. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing that's been pointed out is that I showed uh, or I said that comet, uh, the comet's tail is not actually going to brush Venus. It looks like it will in the images, uh, but that's just because you're looking from the two-dimensional image. Space is three-dimensional. And the three-dimensional relationship of the orbit of the comet to the orbit of Venus will not allow the tail to brush Venus. So here's the perspective that Stereo Ahead has on July 6th. You can see the comet here. If I zoom in a little bit more, there's the comet's tail. So yeah, from that perspective, it would look like uh, that the comet's tail would brush Venus. But that's not actually what's going to happen. Because in three dimensions, we see the comet if we go back to back to July 6th here for a second, you see the comet's way over here. Venus is way over here. And if I zoom out, stereo ahead is looking at these two. But unless you know the, the relative distance, uh, you find that you, you would you would think that maybe the tail is going to brush Venus. But actually, the comet's much closer to the stereo spacecraft than it is to Venus. And by the time the comet reaches the position of Venus and essentially elliptical longitude, uh, it's way above the orbital plane of Venus. So the tail pointing away from the sun will still not brush the planet. Sorry, it's just how it is. Uh, the other thing somebody asked about was Eris. Okay, so in the 2012 images I showed, Eris was at least in the same field of view. It wasn't actually where uh, the lens flare was in the image though, and these images from stereo head HI2 are huge. They're like 70 degree field of view. And in this case, uh, Eris isn't even in the field of view. Eris is way the heck over here. It's nowhere near where this is going on. So no, it's not Eris. It's not related to Eris. Eris just happened to be in the field of view in the 2012 images I showed. Uh, but it's not in the 2014, so it's not related to Eris. Okay, uh, that's that. So I think that covers just about everything. Uh, it is just a lens flare. This happens every time Venus reaches this position in the image. You can find other images of it just by finding out when v Venus reached uh, the same angular separation of the sun in previous images. Then go look up those images, and guess what you're going to find? You're going to find this guy. That's how it is. Uh, it, I didn't Photoshop it out of the images. It's not actually as bright as Venus. It's actually just a very dim lens flare. Um, that's all there is to it. Have a nice day. Uh, P.S. One other thing. Uh, lens flares don't necessarily look like the objects that are creating them. They can take on very different shapes. Here's the bright star of Vega and a lens flare. Oh, look, it's kind of a, a line shape, kind of like what we see in the stereo head HI2 images. Here's Venus and a lens flare that's C-shaped. Here's the caption for this. Bright planet and internal lens flare. Uh, lens flares can take on any shape. It depends on the, uh, the shape of the optics. It depends on the optical train. Um, and Stereo Head HI2 happens to produce lens flares that look like this. So that's why you have to compare it to other HI2 images to see what the lens flare, what lens flares in HI2 ought to look like. Because it's a custom camera. It's quite unlike any camera you're going to find in a store. It's a custom-built camera for the Stereo spacecraft. So the lens configuration and everything else, the, the baffle system, it's all very unique. And so the only way to determine what the uh, lens flare should look like from HI2 is to look at HI2 images. Uh, sorry, that's just how you have to do it. 
but you can consistently find the same lens flare every time Venus reaches this angular separation from the sun. So that must mean it's a lens flare related to Venus. It's not related to Eris. It's not a neutron star approaching our sun. It's just a lens flare from Venus.